We've all heard the joke that a topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee mug and a donut, because you can squish one into the shape of the other. But a topologist can tell a donut from a donut hole because they have a different number of holes. But why would you expect holes to be an invariance at all? When I first started to learn topology, I thought it was because in topology you were allowed to stretch and twist shapes, but not cut or glue them. Certainly I thought to myself, twisting, stretching, and squishing can't change the number of holes. But then I learned that that was all a lie, because topologists cut and glue things all the time. There's literally a result called the gluing lemma. The explanation that I got later on was that it had to do with something called the fundamental group. This is true, but I wasn't satisfied with this answer. Not only did this explanation seem a bit complicated for something as seemingly simple as a whole, it also just didn't make sense in some cases. Like, am I supposed to believe this space has half a hole? What would that even mean? It wasn't until later that I learned that there is a much simpler explanation. And that is what I'm going to share with you today. But let's get one thing straight first. What do we mean when we say two mathematical objects are the same? To begin with, we must first remember that all mathematical objects consist of two pieces, sets and structures. Sets are the more primitive bit. They're just collections of things. Could be anything, numbers, points in space, whatever. So the most basic condition for two mathematical objects to be the same is that we should be able to pair up every member of one set with one and only one member of the other set. The fancy word for this is a bijection. In the case of topological spaces, it means that our first step in checking whether two spaces are the same or not is to make sure that we can pair up all the points in one space with all of the points in the other space. Seems simple enough. Structure, however, is where it gets more interesting. Every mathematical object has some list of rules it must satisfy. Let's take an easy example like groups. I won't go into much detail about what groups are, as it's not necessary for this video, and many of you watching may already be familiar, but here's a quick rundown. All groups follow these rules. You have a set with some associative operation, there's some element of a group that doesn't do anything, and every element has an evil twin that wants to unalive it. So, if two groups are the same, you not only need a bijection between the sets they're made of, you also want to make sure the bijection doesn't break the group rules. Let's do an example. Consider the group Z6. This is just the numbers 0 through 5, where the operation is adding numbers as if you were on a 6 hour clock. And consider also the group S3, which is the set of all the ways you can shuffle three different things, and the operation is just doing one shuffle after the other. Both of these groups are made up of six things, so I can easily find a bijection between them. Let's say I pair them up like this. Now notice, in the six hour clock, three hours past four o'clock is one o'clock. So if these two groups were the same, we'd expect that if we do the permutation paired with three and the permutation we paired with four, then we get the permutation we paired with one. But when we actually work it out, we get the three permutation combined with the four permutation gives us the two permutation. In other words, this bijection does not preserve the structure of the group. So we can't say that they're the same yet. Maybe we need a different bijection, maybe that will work. As it turns out, you cannot come up with a bijection between these groups that preserves the group structures. They are not the same at all. This is mainly that because for Z6, the order in which you add doesn't matter. But for the permutation group, the order in which you shuffle does matter. This detail about the structure tells us these two groups are mathematically different. So, to start telling apart topological spaces, we first need to figure out what the structure of a topological space is. A topological space starts out with a set of points that we'll call x. We then want to build a collection of subsets of x that follow these three rules. 1. Two of these subsets are the sets with all of the points in x and the set with none of the points in x. 2. No matter how many subsets in the collection you combine, you get another subset in the collection. 3. When you look at the overlap of two subsets in the collection, it's another subset in the collection. We call the subsets in the collection open sets, and we call the collection of open sets a topology on x. So, the structure of a topological space depends entirely on the open sets. In fact, the name open set should remind you of something. Open intervals behave exactly like this. The notion of a topology on a set 
generalizes open intervals to sets other than the real number line. So to check that two topological spaces are the same, we first make sure we can pair up all of their points. And then all we have to do is see if we can pair up all the open sets in one space with all the open sets in the other space. This pairing is what topologists call a homeomorphism. Now, coming up with such pairings in practice is quite difficult. So instead of trying to figure out when two spaces are the same, it's more fruitful to figure out when the two spaces are different. How exactly are we going to do that? Well, we were able to tell Z6 and S3 apart because one had a property that the other didn't, the commutative property. We'll do a similar trick with topological spaces. We can tell two spaces apart by seeing if one space has a property that the other one doesn't have. So what is the special property then? The property that is most useful to our study of holes turns out to be what's called connectedness. You might think the concept of being a connected space is pretty self-explanatory, but mathematicians can't sleep at night unless they've lost all grip on reality. There's a lovely little video that I recommend you watch to see why connectedness is actually counterintuitive. The link is in the description. Disconnectedness, however, behaves exactly like you would expect. We say that a topological space is disconnected if you can divide it into non-empty, non-overlapping open sets. In other words, it can be broken into two or more pieces. So to avoid mind-melting horrors beyond your comprehension, we say that a topological space is connected if it's not disconnected. It should be no surprise then that we could tell two spaces apart if one is connected while the other is disconnected. You just can't pair up the open sets. Not only that, but you can tell two disconnected spaces apart based on how many connected pieces they have. With that in mind, we can now get to the heart of this video. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. What does connectedness have to do with holes? Well, it turns out that connectedness by itself isn't a great way of telling spaces apart. Lots of spaces are connected. And I mean lots and lots and lots of spaces are connected. But there's a workaround. Instead of talking about connectedness directly, we just see how far off a space is from being disconnected. What does that mean? Well, take a look at the plus sign and the minus sign. One way you can prove that these spaces are not homeomorphic is by removing a point. When you remove the center point from the plus sign, we get four connected components. But when you remove the center point from the minus, we get only two connected components. If these spaces were homeomorphic, then the resulting spaces after removing a point should still be homeomorphic. But clearly they can't be because they don't have the same number of connected components. So the original spaces couldn't have been homeomorphic. This line of reasoning enables us to answer our original question. How do we know for sure that the surface of a donut and the surface of a donut hole aren't the same thing? Or, stated more mathematically, how can we show that the torus and the sphere are not homeomorphic? Imagine I draw a circle on the sphere and then cut the sphere along the circle. When I do this, I get two disconnected pieces. And no matter where or how I draw this loop, I will always end up with at least two disconnected pieces. We can play the same game with the torus too, draw loops, cut along the loops, and see how many disconnected pieces you get. But what separates the torus from the sphere is that it is possible to cut the torus in such a way that it stays connected. The fact that we can cut the torus this way and not the sphere tells us that these two spaces cannot be the same. And it is the hole in the torus that makes this kind of cut possible. Now notice, if we make a second cut along another loop, the space will be disconnected, so one cut is the limit here. But the more, the more holes the space has, the more cuts you can make without disconnecting the space. In technical terms, we call the maximum number of loops you can cut out without disconnecting the surface the genus of the surface. There we go, holes explained. Well, I should probably come clean about some things I've swept under the rug. You see, hole isn't a technical term in topology because it could refer to so many different things. For instance, does the hollow inside of a sphere count as a hole? In some sense, it feels like it should be, but we just said the sphere has no holes. Even if we take genus to be the definition of a hole, we run into some problems. For example, this space here certainly looks like it has a hole, but cutting along any loop you draw on it will disconnect it, so it has genus zero, just like the sphere. Also notice that genus really only makes sense for some spaces. Remember, to define genus, we cut up a space along 
a line as if we were cutting up a sheet of paper. So for spaces that look 2D up close, like paper, this works fine. But it wouldn't really work for spaces that look 3D up close. This video wasn't meant to be a comprehensive guide to holes in topology. Such a video would be way too long. Rather, it's to make the point that we don't always need to bring out the heavy machinery to better understand a mathematical concept. Oftentimes, it's more insightful just to start reasoning from the basics. Well, that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and feel free to share this video with a friend. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions in the comment section below. And remember, when life gives you lemmas, make lemonade.